You own rental yeah. properties, bad. You you do Airbnb arbitrage, bad. We don't mind if you're successful and make a lot of money in Canada, unless you make money in real estate. Then you are a bad person. Welcome to the Tom Story Show with Steve Karish and Tom Story, where we discuss everything real estate or whatever else is on our minds. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Tom Story Show. I appreciate you being here. If you're watching us on YouTube and you have not already, just subscribe to the channel. Steve, we've talked about this 3,500. Woo! We're all, are we past 3,500 now? Or we're getting close? I don't even know. We'll find, we'll find out as we, as we look at this episode later. Um, Your number 3,500. Put it in the comments. Yeah, let us know when you subscribe, what number subscriber you were. Let us know in the comments. We'd appreciate that. And if you watch this podcast today on YouTube and you find it educational, learn something new, all we ask is that you hit that like button. Steve, who is this episode brought to the viewers by? I really hope it's... <laughs> Realty Ninja. <laughs> I hope it's Realty Ninja. <laughs> and we will learn more about them later in the show. If you're listening on the audio platforms, just want to say thank you. I hope you're having a great day. Now, before I introduce the guests, I just want to say something. I was telling Steve this before we started recording. I woke up this morning in like a pretty shitty mood. Everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong yesterday. Had all these deals fall apart for reasons that were out of my control. Played hockey late last night, woke up this morning with like a major headache, was kind of like not feeling great. And then I saw both your faces, well, really just the person's face in the middle and immediately I feel better. So my piece of advice for people is if you're having a bad day, talk to people that you like, that make you excited, that bring you energy because immediately I'm feeling better uh, just recording this podcast. And that leads or if me you're to having a good day, just phone me. <laughs> yeah, Steve can, bring it... <laughs> Steve, Steve can bring I'll you down. I'll knock you down a couple of things. Yeah, exactly. We have a return guest today. I think the last time you were on, Derek, was almost a year ago. Is it? Was it a year ago? It was like, like literally a year ago, yeah. Yeah. And in that episode, we talked about everything that you were doing in Calgary with Airbnb arbitrage and how that was going. I know things have kind of shifted since then. Derek Timmons is back on the show. He is a real estate team leader out of Calgary. He crushes it. His team sells over 100 properties a year. And... We've been talking kind of just on the phone, like, I guess not technically offline, but not officially on this podcast about everything that's going on with the investment going into Calgary. So we appreciate you being back on the show. Thanks. It's always a pleasure to chat with you guys. You didn't have mustaches last year, so I'll admit the intimidation factor is a little bit higher. Um, and Tom, I talked to you on the phone yesterday and you didn't sound rattled at all. So um, you're, you hide it well, but uh, I, I agree. I kept it's, it down uh, low. It was real deep, yeah. deep. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's amazing when you talk to someone that, it, you know, is on this not same level, but like has energy with the way that you do too. And because um, I hung up that call with you yesterday and I was pumped up too. So I appreciate your time. Well, thank you for being back here. Now we have, I have a list of notes for this episode. That's probably the longest I've ever had for any episode. So we definitely have things to cover. Steve's nodding his head. He's like, yeah, this is, this is a lot today. I want to start yeah, Tom, off. Tom did his, what are we, a year and a half in and Tom did his first prep. That's good. Good job, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> but still, I, I can promise the viewers, Derek doesn't know half the questions I'm going to ask him today. So it's going to be as free flowing as it ever has been. Now, what we have to acknowledge at the beginning of this podcast is what's going on with the federal, federal government and how they're going to save the Canadian housing market. So I want to get opinions. This is Steve's favorite topic. I want to get opinions on a few things that were said in uh, Freeland's fiscal update, okay, and how it's going to impact people listening to this podcast. Okay, so the first one is that this is not in place yet, but there's plans to do it to create a Canadian mortgage charter. Interesting. So what does this mean? Steve complains a lot about the fact that we're really stuck in our five year fixed here. And you can't have longer terms and the penalties are ridiculous. Steve, I think the government might be listening to you. I think it might be what's working. Gonna, what's going to be in that? I didn't okay. hear this part. What's going to be in that? Okay, so here's where this goes. Now, if there are people that are struggling, they're going to love hearing this. If there are people that do not own real estate and they want people to struggle so that more properties come to the market and prices go down, you're not going to like this. Like that's that's just what this is going to be. Number one, it's going to allow temporary extensions on the amortization period of mortgage holders at risk. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, so you want you let let's start there. Let's start there, Steve. You're already laughing. What do you, what do you think about that? They're gonna legalize the bailout of amortizations. Great. Yes. Let's keep basically. Going. Yeah, Derek, cool. Any thoughts on that one? I'm not even sure I wrap my can wrap my head around that. So how right. like what are the stipulations? Like you have to prove exactly. that you can't make your payments. Hey, That's hey, a hey! Great this question. Is, we're not worried about stipulations here because <laughs> yeah. as they're doing in BC right now with all of our property laws, they're putting the law into effect, and then there's a section that says TBA afterwards. So they're going to figure out all that stuff later on. But basically, what they're this whole talk about this amortization extension, if you're screwed and you can push your amortization out, they just basically want to legalize that, from what I understand. Hmm. So, yeah, yeah, and keep in mind everything that we're saying today is they have plans to create this. This is not in place right now. Yeah. <laughs> Number two, waive fees and costs that would have otherwise been charged for relief measures. So people that would have had to pay more for whatever reason, I don't know if that's getting more new appraisals done or something, basically saying that the, the banks can't kind of screw you if you're in a tough position, you have to pay more to get something done. I don't know exactly what that means. Okay. Is there any chance that could mean no more massive mortgage penalties to break terms? I doubt it, but I would I would I'm assume say that would be good. So maybe, maybe, but only again if you can prove that you're at risk of not being able to make your payments. Right. So I think this is only for people that are in a tough position, right? This one's kind of big. Not require insured mortgage holders to requalify under the insured minimum qualification rate when switching lenders at mortgage renewal. Okay. So what this basically means to me is removing the stress test if you're changing mm. banks. That's big. Yeah. Because no. right now you don't have to do it again if you're staying with the same lender. But if you're changing lenders, you're being requalified at the higher rate. Thoughts on that, Derek? Well, that that could potentially have a huge impact for sure because um, people will start to get savvy and it'll make banks more competitive with each other because, yeah. I mean, I just threw it in Scotia's face recently where, um, and we'll probably get into this later, like we're removing one of our partners off of a rental property that we have. All we want to do is take their name off and they tried to charge us $9,800 to do that because the lease is, or the term is only uh, 18 months into the five-year term. And I basically threw down and said, if you make me do this, if you make me pay this penalty just out of principle, I'm taking both of my mortgages to RBC and you guys can stuff it. Um, and we had a big battle. But but getting back on topic, um, someone that's in a position where they're like, hey, my term's coming up, um, I could get a better rate somewhere else or not have to pay this or not qualify at a higher rate, could refinance, take more money. That could That could have some positive impact for sure. And next time they they say something like that to you, you just say, I'm going to go on the Tom Story Show and I'm going to talk about it yeah. publicly. So you guys yeah. better be should, Tom, this should only happen if it's going directly sideways. What they have to avoid is the possibility of people using this to try and refinance and say amortize back out or get a... I mean, this should be a tool to get a better rate and a lower payment. This shouldn't be a tool to remortgage and pull more money out in a cheaper way. So hopefully they One. do it. And people will take advantage of it. Anytime of they, they do any policy like that, people are going to find a loophole so that they can get more properties, get more money, do whatever. So hard. Governing a country, man. I don't know how. So the next one is... They Neither do it... they, Derek. Don't worry. Neither <laughs> yeah. do they. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> the next one is that they're going to make it mandatory that the mortgage provider has to contact the homeowner four to six months in advance of their mortgage renewal to inform them of their options. Um, I don't know legally what the time frame is now. I, I got something six months in advance for mine, so I was aware for my bank, but maybe that's not standard practice. It's usually maybe. however long they can hold your rate for you. So it's usually between 90 and 120 days because okay. what's the point if it's not between 90 and 100 days? Here's your options. By the way, I won't hold that rate for you. So yeah, waste of time. And then two more here. Okay. So they're going to give homeowners at risk. Again, what does that mean? We'll find out the ability to make lump sum payments to avoid negative amortizations or sell their principal residence without any prepayment penalties. Okay. So, okay. Derek, so if, you're risk, if, if you're at risk, if you're at risk, but you have a chunk risk. of money. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, give me sorry, a break. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> this is funny. where if, if you're at risk, there um then you can waive the penalties if you're at risk so this is leading to the other one that we talked about other fees number two um 
this is where they're not going to waive penalties because they're only going to waive penalties for those people. And then was it Mike we were speaking with that was in that situation where he couldn't put down he couldn't put down enough uh, lump sum to bring him back into amortization, which is a stupid rule. Um, I think that that would be easily you could get around that just by changing the contract with having two people that want to benefit from it. What I kind of like from this one is, yes, I know on the surface it sounds stupid. Okay, people at risk have the ability to make lump sum payments. So it's like, well, they won't have the ability to make lump sum payments. But maybe, and again, this goes back to bank of mom and dad, bank of family, bank of everything. But okay, you're kind of screwed. Your mortgage doesn't allow you to make a lump sum payment for another six months. They will now allow you to do it now because you get the help from family that will then help the mortgage. This could help people. Like, I, I you know, it could. Um yeah. Go on. Yeah, Derek, go on. Well, well, there is that one factor. Like, I mean, the baby boomers are are transferring a huge amount of wealth right now, right? And and will continue for the next 30 years. So I think the last stat that I read was 35% of new homeowners right now are using are getting their down payment from an inheritance. So wow. that would make sense. If if someone had a um if someone had an opportunity where it's like, hey, mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, or whatever, like I'm in trouble, their bank's gonna let me put 40, 50 grand on. Can you help me? That would make sense. But I mean, like for someone like myself, that's never had any help from anybody or option for that help. Um, if I'm screwed, I'm screwed. So it, it, I mean, it's not leveling the play off playing field at all, but it is helpful to the people that can take advantage of it. Uh, Steve, one day, are you going to leave your kids your money? Or are you going to make them really work for it? Uh, hopefully they don't get it till they're old enough. How to know how to use it. Yeah. Or already have their own. Yeah. 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 Totally. That's when they should get it. Don't leave don't mm-hmm. leave somebody that hasn't earned money money. Now, the final thing here, and then we'll quickly just talk on the rental relief side of of this uh, fiscal update. Now, this the first time I read it, I was like, what does this mean? Not charge interest on interest <laughs> in the event that a mortgage relief measure results in a temporary period of negative amortization. Okay. So, so uh, if you're growing in your if you're negative amortizing, you're adding money to your mortgage. So they're saying the money you add to your mortgage, you pay interest. you're not going to be able to charge interest on that portion. I would say that is a policy written by someone who doesn't understand how math works. Because yeah. you're going to yeah. need, like the institutions, if you're racking up a bill, why wouldn't I just continuously let it rack up and then take that money interest-free and do something like it doesn't make any sense. There's gonna that's gonna be something that I would suggest probably will not come into play at all. And I would expect from everything that we just talked about. Okay, they've said they have plans to create this Canadian mortgage charter. Um, I will assume that some of the banks will give pushback on certain points of this, and then the official thing that comes out. Who knows when this comes out officially? Will be slightly different than what we talked about today. So just keep that in mind. Now, quickly, just to keep on this rental relief. Okay, the one thing that has gone up consistently since 2020 for everything, for everybody, for all of Canada is the cost of renting real estate in this country. Here's what they're going to do. Okay, again, the federal government, Stephen, is going to save us for the rental side of of things. Of course they are. Of course they are. Prime Minister Freeland is going to fix it all. $15 billion (laughs) in new loan funding starting, starting in 2025, 2026. Start it now. Start it now. Um, For the apartment construction loan program to support more than 30,000 new homes. Okay. So this is an extension of a program formerly known as the rental construction financing initiative, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So more money into helping Canadians own nothing and be happy. I'm, I'm just joking. Okay. Now 1 billion over three years, starting in 2025, 2026 for affordable housing fund, more than 7,000 new nonprofit co-op public housing. This is all great. Why is this all starting in 2025, 2026? Because by then they won't need it. They might not be like they in, always, in they, government. They always do things a year, a year late, you know, like it's always like, I don't know. And then, so what? They're gonna they're building more units. How's that gonna help with the rent? Like they, they think that by building more, like we still have an alarming amount of people coming to the country. We still Agreed. have a huge shortage. Uh, How is it shortage? So I, I don't want to be super pessimistic on this, but I will say, like, if you just look at the at the numbers of population growth in Canada, e- even if all of this goes into place and they build all these things on time on budget, which is unlikely to happen. Probably still, all it will mean is that rental prices just won't go up as fast. 
You know, they're no. still going to be expensive. They just, you know, they probably won't go down. Steve's smirking over there. What do you got, Steve? Oh, it's funny. Yeah, we'll give this to you um, right after you reelect us and we all get our pensions. Yeah. Um, which yeah. is which is exactly the reason why Jagmeet's propping up this government, by the way, so he can get his, if he lives till 90, what is it, $2.4 million in pension? Um, what is this actually going to do? It's Here's, here's a, your hint of what it's going to do. It's an expansion of a program that's already not working. This episode of the Tom Story Show is brought to you by Realty Ninja. Hey, real estate agents, I bet you didn't get into the real estate industry to try to become a web developer. Realty Ninja will help you build a beautiful website for your business without becoming all techie, because me and Steve are certainly not techie. They'll set up your entire site for you. They'll migrate the content from your current site, and they'll take care of all the back end, switching the domains, all the things that you don't want to do, they'll take care of for you. Their team of in-house designers will make your new site match your current brand and help you stand out from your competitors. Best of all, Realty Ninja offers a free unlimited trial that lets you build out your website and they do not charge you until you're ready to launch. That's right, they are so confident in their product and that you're gonna love the website that you build with them. They will not charge you until it's ready to launch. They don't even take your credit card details. Listeners of the Tom Story Show will not only get an unlimited trial before you launch, but if you go to realtyninja.com slash Tom, you will get 20% off your first year after you launch. A beautiful, functional, and professional website is absolutely a must in today's real estate landscape and Realty Ninja delivers. So go to realtyninja.com slash Tom for 20% off your first year. That's realtyninja.com slash Tom. And now back to the podcast. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Cool. Like, so we're going to let you borrow what is billion. Who's borrowing money from the government? For instance, who's you know that two and a half percent home ownership or five percent home ownership program that they brought in that was going to make housing affordable for people? Yeah, Who's I think no, like no, nobody took advantage of that. Nobody ever. There's been like seventy five of those loans or whatever handed out ever. So, <laughs> like, what a waste of time. This is more yeah. wasting time. This is a absolutely nothing. And I don't know. It's. I can't see it doing anything at all for anyone ever. Okay. Well, there you go. There's your update on what uh, the federal government is doing to solve. Now, obviously, the fiscal update had lots more information about groceries and everything else, but this is a real estate podcast and we'll just focus on the real estate side. Now, Derek, I've got some questions for you. Um, the last time we were here, we talked all about Airbnb and we'll get to that in a second. But I actually want to start with the fact that I know from the comments of this of this YouTube channel for this show and people that reach out to us, there's a lot of people that listen to this that maybe feel like, okay, they're at a point in life and maybe they don't have a lot of savings. Maybe they're in debt and maybe they're renting right now and they feel trapped and like, there's no way out of this. I'll never be able to afford a home. Derek, you are wildly successful at what you do, um, but that all happened in the last five years. Is that fair? Yeah, very much so. so. You, you know, you didn't buy your first house to live in until you were in your mid thirties, you know? So if there's people listening to this that are, that were in the position that you were in, I don't know how much you want to share or not share, but just, could you give the listeners and viewers like an idea of what is possible if you find something you love and you're passionate about and you make it happen? Totally. So I actually, my girlfriend, Catherine and I just moved into our, what we're at this point in time, it feels like it's our dream home. Um, and I'm 39. I'll be 40 in April. And I am a first time home buyer. Uh, this is my first home that I've ever lived in that I had my name on a title. Um, so, I mean, you know, we skipped a lot of steps. Catherine was a homeowner before, uh, before I was, she had a townhouse. So she climbed the ladder or started climbing the ladder and then skipped a whole bunch of steps. Um, but I actually bought and sold five properties before we bought this house. So we flipped four properties in 2021. She's a interior designer. I'm a former contractor and a realtor. So the partnership really made sense. And we, we had an outside investor um, that supplied the cash and the capital that we needed. Um, but we, we flipped house after house after house and then used the money that we made from those flips to purchase a rental property and put a down payment with a builder to build this house. Um, 
So I'm not sure if that's necessarily what you were wanting to hear, but but to touch on your point, five years ago, six years ago, oh, okay, so I'm almost done my fifth year of full-time real estate at the end of uh, April of next year. will be five years full-time. But when I started in real estate, man, I... I I was so broke I couldn't pay attention. Like it was, it was, it was terrible. Like it was, we had my my mom lived with us at the time. My line of credit was maxed. Visa was maxed. Her line of credit was maxed. Like we could. I remember at one point in time, I got six listings in ten days, and uh, I had no money for lock boxes and photos and all these things. I asked the brokerage that I worked with for a personal loan. They said no. It was a tough time, but um, but we came through that, and and now our life is so so much different. But but to give people some sort of hope or, or whatever is that if you do things right and to be a hundred percent honest, I'm not trying to be corny or cliche or whatever, but you two guys were huge inspirations to me, um, for taking these steps. Tom, I remember very specifically phoning you being like, dude, like I, I want to buy this house. I want to flip it. I know the numbers make sense, but I'm terrified. Like I was shitting my pants. I don't know if I'm not supposed to swear, but no, you can, swear. um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, I'll, I'll keep it down. But, uh, but, um, but you were like, do it, man. If the numbers make sense, do it. And then on that one property, we made $140,000. And then we turned it into another one. And we turned it into another one. And we just kept going and going. But it's totally normal to be afraid. It's totally normal to, uh, you know, to, to be unsure of the unknown. Like when we bought our first rental property, we were terrified. You know, 20% down, huge amount of money. Is this going to work? And that was the one that we put on Airbnb. It's still on Airbnb. And it's printing money like it's amazing but the first 60 days of home ownership in any facet are going to be scary but once you're in there it's just like anything you do it for a little bit you get comfortable with it then you want to take another step forward you know you want to you want to go up the ladder and like i watched your journey uh, uh and steve same thing i've watched your journey of like you know buy a condo move up get a townhouse get a detached with a basement suite you know sell this to buy that it's it's a plan if and if you want to move forward with your life you need to find a plan that's going to work for you and an advisor like one of us who's done it before or understands it clearly that can walk you through the steps like when i before um it's no secret. Anyone that knows me knows that I've had a, a past with drugs and alcohol. I'm, I'm coming up actually in December on nine years sober, but Congrats, when man. I first, thank you. I appreciate that. When I first got sober, um, I owed Canada revenue $65,000 and I had a 540 credit score. Like I couldn't even get a loan from the bank for a nickel. Um, and then I, ha I had this like meltdown at the teller one day at RBC and the dude who has become a very dear friend of mine um, was like, do you want to just sit down and talk? Uh, Cause I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And he laid out this plan for me to rebuild my credit and how I would do it. And one step at a time. And now I just checked my credit a couple weeks ago and I'm like at 854, which is like, it brings tears to my eyes some days to look at it. Right. But like back at, back then it was just like, it was so overwhelming because we're not being taught this stuff, but it's really a simple plan, simple process, just like building a real estate business or for you guys building a podcast, which by the way, congratulations. Like, I mean, to have the amount of views and stuff, it, it's it's a it's a big task. It's a huge commitment, but it's a plan that you followed. You can't look me in the eye and tell me you didn't do this by design. This was something that you didn't just wing this. This happened exactly as you planned it. You know, maybe you didn't expect to have this many followers or views by now, but you knew if we do this many episodes uh, at this interval with these types of people and have this type of content, and we shift when things aren't going right, mm -hmm. or shift and continue in the same direction when things are. We're going to get results. And that's just like anything in life and business. Now, the one thing that Steve talks about all the time, and I see this in the comments, is when people say, you know, what do I do? I feel like I'm stuck. And, and Derek, going from where you were with the past that you had, and I typically see Steve's advice is, well, find a way to earn more money or up your skills to get a job that earns you more money. Um, yes. Steve, do you want to quickly touch on that before we go back to Derek on exactly what he did? Now, now, yours was in the skills of building up your real estate business and doing what you did in the contracting and flipping. But Steve, do you want to go on one of your your famous little rants here on? Well, that's the question I was going to have for yeah. Derek is what is. So let's go back and picture yourself there. So Derek, you're struggling coming out of addiction. You have not only no money, you owe way more. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you're supporting your son and your mom at the time. Yep. Right. And like, let's call it supporting is a, I mean, it was not really supporting. <laughs> right? It was, it was yeah. a tough go. It was like, it was yeah. hand to mouth. Right. Mm -hmm. So put yourself back in that situation. Think about it back on it. Now, obviously now you're in a great spot, but what is that first thing you can do 
to start the ball rolling because it's easy to go, okay, well, now Eric's got it made or Derek's got it made and we're all, we're all good to go. Sorry, I just called out a team member's name there for no reason. Um, Derek's got it figured out. But yeah, he's got it figured out. He lucked out. He had good timing in the market. He had it. But you now go back and go, okay, what is that first stepping point for somebody that's struggling there? What did you do or what can you tell someone else to do to just take that first step in the right direction? I love that question. I've actually never been asked that before, but what I can tell you from honest sincerity is that it's all about your habits and your behaviors, your disciplines that you do. And they have to start very, very, very small and be incremental. So you can't look at, you know, where I remember looking at you guys when I first joined the real estate industry and was so intimidated because you were already so successful and doing so well. And I was like, I, when I joined RRI, I had ever, I had only ever sold three houses. So and again, Tom said to me, like, don't compare your chapter one to my chapter 12 because you just started. So just focus on what you're doing. So when I was $65,000 in debt, um, uh, what I did was I was like, okay, where am I spending my money? And I started with these really, really small and incremental habits. So the money that I was spending on drugs and alcohol, I'm sure you can imagine was substantial. So that just started going to debt. I was already used to spending that. So I was just like dishing that away. Um, I heard, um, um, I think it was Jim Rohn. He said something, uh, that said, you know, you must develop the habits when the numbers are small, because you cannot expect yourself to follow that habit or begin it when the numbers are large. If you won't save $10 out of a hundred, when you're broke, you won't save a hundred thousand out of a million when you're rich and you'll stay broke. Yeah. Right. So, um, the habits that you develop over time that you slowly and incrementally get used to, um, is what will lay the path for you. And every step forward in the right direction is another step towards the goal that you ultimately want to accomplish. So that's all I did was I just, I just planned it out and was like, look, it took me two years to pay that, um, that tax bill off, uh, because I was, I was showing up to work in good shape. I was making more money. All right. Um, I wasn't spending crazy because I had nothing to do. I was bored all the time. I was sitting in AA meetings every day. So I was like pretty, <laughs> pretty much on lockdown. But, um, but, but so all that money that I that had extra, it took me two years to pay off that debt. And then I had a back tax bill because the, the money that I was earning in that two years, I wasn't saving taxes for because I had to pick one or the other. So it took me another year and a half to pay that off. But during that time, I started my real estate career. So then all of a sudden I got into real estate and I was making extra money. I developed other, other skills. So my first year in real estate, I made $30,000, which was... Uh, actually, it's, that's a lie. My first year in real estate, I made fifteen thousand dollars, but that all went towards bettering myself and in developing my skills. So, um, one step at a time, small little progress, and then eventually, over time, you look back and you're five years later, like, oh my god, what has happened in my life? Like, you, you don't even recognize it. And I and your path was obviously, and that's how we all know each other, is that you went into the industry that that me and Steve were in previously, and we're all in real estate. But I think anybody that's listening or watching this can go, okay. I'm I'm at this point in my life, whatever your version of where you were, Derek, to get out of that point. And, and you know, the path for everyone's certainly not going to become a real estate agent, right? But it's whatever the path is for you to go to. Okay, well, how do you become more skilled at the thing you want to do? Doesn't mean you have to swallow your pride and go back to night school to learn a new skill on something. Doesn't mean that you have to spend less time going out to bars and stuff and sitting in front of your computer and doing what we would call YouTube university. You can learn anything you want by sitting in front of the computer, turning off your phone with a notepad and taking notes. You can use AI tools to summarize all these videos now, right? There's, there's amazing, amazing things you can do. And it's just really neat to see that from where you were in f five years, like I think Derek, your team sold over 120 homes this year already. Yep. So whatever that version of success for anybody listening is and whatever that they do, it's possible. Right. And and we always joke. And I think probably I've said this to you before. I'm like, Derek, if I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> like, trust me, <laughs> it's, like, you know, me, me and Steve just show up and, and we have consistency and, and over time you mm -hmm. learn skills. And that's why I think our businesses have grown. But uh, thank you for sharing that because I know we didn't talk about that beforehand about like but the life. I think you have to. What Tom's, I don't know what's Tom's going on. Always got the best stuff going on with his. Anyway, go go timestamp this and go watch it on YouTube. See what just happened. Um, I think though I just listened to two back to back episodes of the Ice Coffee Hour Graham Stephan's podcast, and he had Dave Ramsey on, and then he had Grant Cardone on. 
Oh, oh Uncle nice. G was on? Oh yeah. my goodness, oh. man. Like it was Was he good? Talk about talk about two. Talk about two different strategies, right? Mm-hmm. So Dave Ramsey comes on and Dave Ramsey's number one rule. Number one rule is get a thousand dollars in the bank, rainy day fund. Mm-hmm. And everybody always roasts him because he's like, What are you gonna do with a thousand bucks? You're an idiot. And he's like, Listen, you have to start with the first thing. So yeah. you can think you're going to go and take that thousand bucks and become Grant Cardone, Elon Musk, Warren Buffett, or you can take the first step and save a thousand bucks because most people don't have a thousand bucks. Grant Cardone was the exact opposite. You need to go invest in yourself and take a course because if you got a thousand bucks, it's not enough. If you got 10 million bucks, it's not enough. And <clears throat> most people, and it's funny because he's like, do you think Grant Cardone actually is like, do you think Elon Musk does that? Elon Musk doesn't own his own, his own real estate. Why would he, you know, he, he can rent, you can rent. And it's like, okay, yeah, if you think you're really going to be Elon Musk, but the majority of people are just trying to take that first step yeah. and get themselves out of the hole, mm-hmm. right? So his first step is that. His, his next step is snowball your credit, uh, your debt snowball your debt out and then third step is uh three to six months of of i guess expenses in the bank or whatever but if without that first step and that's where everybody gets stuck i think all the people that are negative in the comments and talking about how they're going to be grant cardone one day are don't have a thousand bucks in the bank because they can't figure that out because who knows maybe they are spending their money on on drugs and alcohol Maybe well, who knows what they're spending it on, but they're definitely not taking the first step. And without the first step, you can't walk on the long journey. For tenant, landlord, or homeowner insurance policies, go to squareone.ca slash the Tom Story Show. Use the link in the description. Save $20 when you start your free quote right now. I'm a huge fan of Grant Cardone. I've consumed a lot of his content um, and I've followed a lot of his um, practices that he advises people to take. And I have a problem with the stay broke mindset or, or mentality that he has. His his mindset is stay broke, take all your liquid cash and get it into an asset that's going to produce an income, which is fine to some extent. But, but I think he's got to put a caveat on there that have that security where there is nothing worse in the morning than waking up and being like, am I going to put gas in my truck or am I going to put food on my table? So like, I understand if you're in a, if you're in a wealthy position and at the end of the year you have excess capital, I don't know why I put that in quotations, but you have extra cash in the bank that you can invest into an asset that's going to generate an income. Great. But most people can't do that. And so, so, so I think both strategies are phenomenal where have the security of like, when I hit a six figure bank account, there's a different level of calmness where you're like, okay, shit can hit the fan like real bad and I'm going to feed my family. And then all of a sudden the rental property starts kicking out three to $5,000 a month cash flow, And you're like, holy shit, this is, this is kind of cool. And then you get the bug for it, but you can't just go all in right away and leave your family in a desperate position. Because when you have that energy of desperation, that worked for me for a year to build my real estate business, because it was just like, I'm either going to make it or I'm not. And so, and I'm starving. We have no money. This has to work. But eventually that really starts to wear you out. So like, I much prefer now be like, I'm tired. I went to a jujitsu class yesterday and I'm sore. I'm sleeping in today. Whereas before I was like, I better be up at 530. I better be on the phone at seven and I better be working for 12 hours or else we're not going to eat. And so that's my problem I have with that stay broke mentality because Grant Cardone's not broke. So he should be caveat, caveating that. Yep. Caveat. 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 Um, We we don't really do English correctly here. I don't trust me. If if I knew I said it. If you think you're going to be Grant Cardone or all those guys, and then when you really get into it, you see one of them, those two guys, Dave Ramsey, one of them is very grounded and understands exactly what he's doing. And the other one is taking Hail Marys to the end zone every single time. And yeah. sure, the Hail Mary to the end zone is going to look like a good strategy. But do you think the the coaches in the NFL are not Hail Marying every pass to the you know to the end zone every single time? There's a reason why there's a strategy of mm-hmm. short gains to win the game. 
And I just there's, feel like there's there's too many people that think they're just going to hail Mary it. And that's why I think like Dave Ramsey's um, the whole thing of like, hey, if you can't do it, like you got to start small. Mm-hmm. Start with that thousand bucks in the bank and then you can move on from there. So mm-hmm. I appreciate you sharing your, your story. Yeah. And that's not a lot of, I'm sure it's not easy for a lot of people that are in it to hear that somebody's got out of it because it must be a tough spot to, to kind of come from. Yeah, it sucks. But I mean, two choices, man. I'm a dad. So it was either end up dead or in jail or pull my shit together and figure it out. So worked out okay. We're proud of you, man. It's awesome to see what you've accomplished. So so honestly, crazy. Like where you are in your business, like I would have like done anything to get there in five years. You, you have gone way past what me and Steve had done at your chapter five. It's amazing. Now I want to kind of change directions here slightly. A few episodes ago, we had Chris Slightum on the podcast and we talked about this, invo- this investing strategy of buying real estate, holding it, get who cares if it goes up in value, paying it down. And then eventually it starts paying you money. And this was, you know, one year rental scenario stuff. Now, Derek, the last time you were on the show, I think actually a few people reached out to you because of the title of that episode, which was was the Airbnb arbitrage. I know I think at the time you had six units, you were doing some where you owned them, some where you were leasing them for a year with permission of the owner, and then Airbnb and again. That has has it shifted slightly on there? Are you still doing that with all the new Airbnb crackdowns potentially coming? Are you are you still focused on that? Uh, we are still doing it. We have changed our strategy dramatically. So we have um, gotten rid of the arbitrage model. And so for those of you who are listening, who are unfamiliar with, the, with with what that means, the arbitrage model, it means we take a lease on a property. Uh, we sign a one year lease with the, with a with an owner and we disclose to them fully what our intentions are to put their property onto the short term rental market with it, which Airbnb, Verbo, all these things. And with their permission, we do that. So we pay them rent, which we agree on, and we collect the profits. So it's like any other business. And the, the the reason I like that model, or I liked it in the beginning, was because you can get into a property for relatively nothing, right? I mean, like we're, we're two of the properties that we had were already fully furnished. So we had between like towels and locks and doorbell cameras, maybe a five to ten thousand dollar investment into the property, and then you're turning a, a profit immediately. Um, so the reason that we've gotten out of the arbitrage model specifically is that they are time consuming. Um, so when we hit six units, um, I was spending three to five hours a week, maybe sometimes, yeah, about that three to five hours a week working on these units. And I started doing a cost analysis between the Airbnb business and the profit it was making, which is very little versus the time I could be spending selling real estate or being with my family, which is very large. Um, it didn't make any sense anymore. So when you're an arbitrage owner or arbitrage, um, you know, controller, um, you don't have access to the equity of the home. You don't get the appreciation of the home, any of those things. Um, but you do get your foot in the market and you get experience. So it's good for that. But we just aren't in the position in our lives where we really cared about that anymore. So the property that we own, um, we bought it for six fifty. I could now sell it for seven hundred, and uh, we've. I think got about twenty thousand dollars in um, you know equity buy down from the from the guests. So, so that is that is the direction we're going. Um, we are still looking to continue to build our portfolio, but it will be strictly from a place of ownership. And at some point in time, when the the number of units that we own gets to be too excessive, we will hire a management company that will run them for us, and then we just kind of deke out of it and collect the money. Because if the federal government um, does crack down mm-hmm. on Airbnb and, and they do it like Toronto and Vancouver rules right now are already like you can't even do it if it's not your primary residence. So it kind of it, it's already like not really feasible. But in your market, it's totally feasible. I guess that would that would change how you would have to look at it or you'd have to flip it completely. Right. If, if this yeah. were to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And w- when that happens, if that does come, we'll address it. I mean, it is a service that is very valuable for people like in the one property that we own right now, we have a, a family whose house burned down and they've been with us for since September 1st. They're going to be with us till January 15th. And the insurance company is paying us like $7,200 yeah. a month for the upper suite just for them to rent it, which for us as investors is amazing. But um, but like, where would they go for five months while their house is being built, right? But and again, it's just like coming back to the the um, federal policies. It's just like there's so many loopholes. Like, yeah, it's a service that people need, but then you get people that like myself that all of a sudden now, you know, I know a guy that has a hundred units that he's running all throughout Canada and, and United States. So it's like people are always going to take advantage of a good system. 
I um I said this on a video I put out recently, but I think the Canadian way is we don't mind if you're successful and make a lot of money in Canada as long as you pay your fifty percent tax bracket. Except if can you make, we get down ex- to a fifty percent tax bracket, please? Uh, you get what I'm saying. Unless unless you make money in real estate, and that then you are a bad person. You own rental no. properties, bad. You you do Airbnb arbitrage, bad. Right? Yeah. You're trying to make your life better. You're trying to find ways because. Anyways, we could go into a whole rant on that. I don't want to make this this episode more political than it needs to be. The one thing I did want to talk about, Derek, is... Wait, is, wait, 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 wait. Okay, wait. well, we're Steve, you want to go on a little rant? Okay, fine. No, we're not done. It, do, you, do you want to transition out of Airbnb right now? Because BC is dropping the hammer. Yeah, yeah. Ravi, Ravi is uh, really coming down. And, and short term now means 90 days in BC, eh? Not 28 like Toronto. That's what I was wrong on the Kaylee episode when I was telling you guys what was going to happen. It's like, oh, no, yours is way more serious. It is getting. So first of all, part of I don't know if it was announced or not, but part of the federal government cracking down, Christia really doing a good job there. She's not going to let you have write offs against your uh, against your maintenance on your short term rental yeah, properties. So good luck with that. Like what's I don't know that that's a really stupid nothing yeah, but the principal residence one changes everything. If that comes into effect, that changes everything. That was already in. So not, it, not in Derek's market. BC. Okay. No, not in Derek's market. But in BC, Vancouver already was like principal residence only, even though I'm sure most of them were getting around it. Um, the things that were brought up, though, that I had never really considered is the tourism. And I think we need a, well, Derek can't participate, but we need a drinking game on this show like every single time we say Ravi's name somebody has to take a a, a swig um but what they didn't acknowledge was how many of the hotel rooms in Vancouver were sold or permanently rented out to the federal government to house the homeless during the pandemic and I know they're in Toronto as well Mm -hmm. so we're in a massive shortage it costs you on average seven hundred dollars a night right now to stay in downtown Vancouver with some Airbnbs. Now take them all out, right? So let, let me keep going here. So the impact on tourism, they actually said, yes, this will negatively affect our, our economy of tourism. Yes, it will. They are saying 100% yes, it will. So Which BC is all, a lot of tourism in BC. If we don't have real estate, let's kill our second Let's kill yeah. our first and second best uh, industries, no right? Like those are anyway. So they think that changing this rule will bring fifteen hundred units province wide to the long term rental market, assuming that the people aren't going to sell them. Fifteen hundred units. Lots so, will okay. sell. Lots will 1, sell. Fifteen hundred units. The speculation tax. Um, they used to have it where if you had rental restrictions in BC, you couldn't rent out your strata unit that you were exempt from the from the speculation tax. Um, that was supposed to bring 2,000 units. Don't know how many it actually did. But another 1,500 units, I mean, we're throwing, we're doing nothing here, right? We're, yeah. we're doing absolutely nothing to actually bring, what does 1,500 units matter if you brought in 150,000 people to the province in 2022? It matters right. almost zero. Like it's a rounding yeah. error. It makes no sense. So principal residence was already exempt in, or, or was already not allowed in Vancouver. Now they're doing it everywhere. Unless, of they course, might, your cities They are, might do it everywhere. Well, if your cities are under 10,000, you're exempt. So they realize that there are these, however, guess where it's still exempt? Whistler. Whistler, baby. <laughs> Whistler, baby. Let's go. Let's Airbnb it in Whistler. $15,000 a night for your $10 million mansion. Let's, let's rock yeah. and roll. These are all kind of silly. But they went to Victoria, and there's one building in Victoria that's like 37 units, and 30 of them are Airbnbs. Wow. And then they interviewed this guy that runs it and it's actually done a really cool thing what he did was he did up the apartment it's like a 370 square foot apartment the bed is up a ladder and over the front door basically right small little hotel room style apartment he did it up like the coffee shop from friends so it feels like you walk in the door and it's like he's got the same couch he's got all the stuff he's like who's gonna live in this day to day yeah 
like who's going to live in 300 like i gotta the reason this is successful is because it replaces a hotel room i can offer it at about the same rate as a hotel room people are happy to be here and no one is going to rent this off of me realistically this hotel room to live in long term do you think that there was a bunch of lobbying did this stop or is it still happening lobbying from the hotel industry for the crackdown countrywide on airbnb i would assume right i would assume like it is it is not a good service in my estimation like it is it's almost needed though because i use derek's airbnb and it was great because we had five people we were coming from a distance we wanted a kitchen i didn't want to find like i don't even know if what that would cost in a hotel has, like, i don't even know if airdrie has a hotel i have no idea i didn't look but it was the perfect scenario right there was get, enough get room this guy took, off the show what the hell took the kids well i don't know he, maybe he can fill does airdrie have a hotel what do you think what do you there, think Steve? there's there's seven <laughs> Okay, well, there's eight with Derek's. But like it was a spot where all of us could be and not be cramped and I could put my kids to bed. Yeah. We went downstairs, watched some TV. Like it was the perfect model. And I think that there is now he, he, let me go to the other side. I don't think they ever should have been brought in. Personally, I'm not a big fan of I think the Airbnb like business model is terrible. I would never do it because of this. It's too mm-hmm. susceptible to government regulation and changes. Mm-hmm. but we don't have a solution. Can we kick all those homeless folks out of the downtown Vancouver hotels and then get those back and rent them out to people to actually bring in tourism, bring in dollars? No, we're not going to do that. Yeah. So they don't really have a solution. They're going to kill our second best uh, industry of tourism to try and fix the destruction of our first best industry. So. This episode of the Tom Story Show is brought to you by none other than my co-host, Steve Karish and Karish Real Properties. Look at that. He's got a mug he can give you if you reach out to him. (laughs) Um, You know, in all seriousness, you know, I I make jokes with Steve all the time on the show and we we have a lot of banter. But the reality is, if you are someone looking to buy in Surrey or the surrounding areas, this is the guy you have to talk to. He understands what's happening. He has well over a decade in the industry, even though he still looks kind of young. Not that young, but kind of young. His team is amazing. They are experts and whether you are buying tomorrow or you are buying in two years from now, what I know is that it's a no pressure operation, right? They're going to give you the information you need. And when you're ready, they will be there with you and take you to the finish line. They're going to roll out the red carpet for you. And Steve knows what he's doing. And if I personally was buying a property there, this is the only person that I would trust to call. He's someone I've also sent my clients as well. So if you want to connect with Steve and his team in Surrey and the surrounding areas, you can go into the first link in the description. And Steve, what do they do when they get to that link? Well, you can book a call with me using that link in the description at a time that works best for you. It's really simple. You just pick the time, enter in your phone number, email address. I'll give you a call at the time. And uh, yeah, we'll see how we can help you out. We also know that a lot of real estate agents listen to this show as well. So if you have clients that are moving out to Steve's direction, make sure to reach out to him as well to see if he can help them throughout their journey. I know they will roll out the red carpet for your clients as well. Okay, Tom, there's only one thing you I want you to clarify. Mm-hmm. First of all, how do you say it? It's the fra- Fr- Fraser, like Razor Valley. Fraser Valley. So if you are in North Delta, Surrey, Langley, Abbotsford, White Rock, or Mission, Give me a call. But Tom, Mm. this communication is not intended to cause or induce breach of any agency agreement. Existing agency agreement. Ah, I almost had it. Steve, Steve, you mentioned that 150,000 people moved to BC last year. Um, In the last 18 months, 166,000 people moved to Alberta. Forget about BC. Alberta is the new cool place, right? So, (laughs) Derek, what have you seen recently is it still happening to the level that it was pandemic where it's like yeah. ontario bc people are coming they're moving their families but they're also investing into your market yeah man it's crazy like we 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 pivoted our business and generated um marketing material um systems uh you know leads follow-up systems things like that and even just like created a system on how to help people move to alberta because the volume of people that we're helping move to calgary from specifically bc and ontario more so ontario than bc but still a lot from both 
um, is so substantial that now when people call us, we're like, hey, we've moved dozens of families. This is our system. This is how we do it. We send them a relocation guide. We get them familiar with the city. We introduce them to our market because we we have to have different conversations with people from Vancouver or Toronto than we do from someone that's within Calgary, like a hundred percent different conversation. Um, but yeah, it's happening. Like, and, and the investors is the big one. Um, there was uh, an insane amount of the numbers that I heard was one builder in Calgary specifically sold 4,500 units to investors from Ontario, uh, pre-construction units, townhouses, duplexes, detached homes, just like massive amounts of, uh, of, of properties. And then now they're all coming to, uh, coming to possession and we're benefiting from this huge in our business. But these investors are like, well, okay, the rates are really high. The rent's not going to cover it. I bought it for four fifty. I could sell it for six hundred. Let's just list it. So, like, we're yeah. literally showing up to the builder's door, grabbing the keys from them, putting a lockbox on, throwing stagers in the next day, and listing it. And within seven days, these guys are getting offers, going firm, and making a hundred grand. So it's um, still it's still working there. It's they're selling. They're they're making money on these investments. But they were pro- these were purchased twenty twenty one and twenty two. Okay, yeah. all right. So before. Yeah you know, the rate apocalypse started. Yeah. But, but here's the prediction is that when the rates start to drop, which I think we can all agree is going to start happening next year. And we don't need to go down that rabbit hole right now, but when the rates start to drop, which they're going to have to, at some point in time, the Alberta market is going to do what Toronto did eight years ago. Um, Because we are still so much lower in, in affordability and people in Alberta are losing their mind because a townhouse is now $500,000. But people in Ontario and BC are also losing their minds because a townhouse is $500,000. It's a different mindset. They're like, people from here are like, what do you mean a townhouse is $500,000? Like a town or 500 grand when I started in real estate five years ago, which is like a blink, uh, 500 grand got you a 2,400 square foot detached home with a fully fenced backyard, a finished basement and a double attached garage, like five to five fifty. Now that's like seven fifty to eight hundred, right? So us Albertans are are having a huge sticker shock with the, what's happening in the market. And it's the same sticker shock, if you will, uh in reverse for the people that are used to spending $1.2 million on a townhouse. And now they're going like I literally like uh, about a month ago turned over keys to a family from Brampton who, uh, or a young couple from Brampton who moved here, they bought a like beautiful home, the same specs as I was just mentioning, like former show homes, 2,400 square feet. Um, you know, but they paid $700,000 for this house. Uh, no land transfer tax, nothing. They just, their closing costs are $1,500. And, uh, and, and I'm going, what would this 700 grand get you in Brampton? And they're saying two bedroom condo at yeah, best probably. with $500 a month condo fees. Yeah. You know? So it's just, I mean, and what we're seeing, so from an investment standpoint, people are looking at the fact that there's no rent control in Alberta. So when your lease is up, I can raise your rent as as high as I want, Uh, which again, like playing the devil's advocate, like it's a shitty thing from a, from a perspective of like having a heart and being a human. Right. But it's an amazing thing from a perspective of I'm an entrepreneur and I'm a businessman and I'm thinking about my bottom lines and my cash flow, And so like, it's, I try my best to stay neutral to that because I'm, we are dealing with a lot of tenants right now. There are a lot of tenant occupied properties because people's values have shot up, but um, there's no rent control. So we can go as high as we want at any point in time. Whereas like I've heard there's people in the GTA that are offering their tenants up to $50,000 just to leave. And they're saying no, because there's nowhere to go. So um, we, we have all these things that like, it's just like this perfect storm for lack of better words, that's going to see explosions. And my prediction is in the next 10 years, our average price in in Calgary will be a million dollars, just like it is where you guys are. And then the next wave will be up to Edmonton or somewhere else. Like it's going to, it's going to just flock throughout the country. Steve will never like Edmonton, no matter how hard. I grew up there. It's it's a, yeah, I don't want to shit on it on the show, but, uh, so Derek, one thing. Oh no, feel free. Edmonton is a terrible place. You can feel free. Steven, Steven. Okay. One thing Derek had said Tom, to me. Have I, you been there? Tom, have you been there? No. It's the Detroit exactly. of Canada. Yeah. It is. Well, and we're not, any, not talking 1950s any, Detroit. Any Edmonton talking, uh, no, listeners here. No, we're talking M&M Prime Detroit. <laughs> 
So, Derek, one thing you had said to me, which, by the way, this is like the most genius ad I've ever seen, is 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 Derek was running ads that said, "Come to Calgary, buy one house, get two free." Right. Yeah. Which which is amazing. Now, this is to Ontario and B.C. people where at first you're like, what the hell is this guy talking about? And you realize, oh, you could actually buy three homes there for the same price I could sell my property for in Toronto. And there's no land transfer tax when I buy there. Now, for people that are this far into the episode and they've been listening to this and I've even now, Steve, I haven't told you this, but so I own one property outside Ontario. I have started to now look at other markets in Canada that are not Toronto for long-term hold real estate that I don't touch and have a property management for. And Calgary is a market that I've considered. What do I need to know? What do people need to know that are in that position? And maybe what we'll do is like, if people are generally interested and this is not like a, an ad or anything for Derek, I just think he's a good guy and knows what he's talking about, but maybe Steve will put in the show description, like a link that people can sign up for Calgary information. Is that, that that's easy to do. We can figure that out. I put in any links in the comments that the guest provides. Okay, so Derek has to send it to us. But if yeah. someone is listening to this and they live in Sean, they live in BC, and they're like, you know what? Fine, I'm giving in. I'm giving in. I'm not yet ready to move to Edmonton, but Calgary I'll consider. Um, what do they need to know? Like, Because the growth you guys have seen, I don't think they should be buying on the fact that they're going to expect that growth because that's mm -hmm. crazy growth. No? Is that fair? Um, eh, that's debatable, man. Uh, I, I truly think now in a short period of time, like we've seen since the beginning of 2021, I don't think we'll see a huge spike in the next 18 months like we have. Um, but if you're buying and holding five to 10 years, yeah, you're going to make a winning purchase. Um, and all the things to consider. Now there's two different avenues. If you're wanting to move to Alberta, so totally different, uh, conversation than if you're wanting to invest in Alberta. Um, if you're wanting to move to Alberta, the things to consider is that our cost of living is significantly lower. We don't have PST. We don't have land transfer tax. Calgary specifically is very close to the mountains. If you've never been to the Rocky Mountains, I mean, it's an amazing place to go to. But also the city is beautiful. We have lots going on here. Our industry is picking up. Um, it's really well laid out. It's just, I love the city. Um, I yeah. could talk about it all day. From the investment standpoint, all the things that we've been just did, been discussing on the show are going to continue to happening. Migration moving here. Like... The, the immigrants coming to this country, they're now looking, it used to be Vancouver, Toronto were the two hubs. And now they're, they're going, Hey, there's a third one. And, and here's our, you know, economic impact of moving to Calgary versus Toronto or Vancouver. So the migration from not only within Canada, but also outside of Canada, that's going to continue to grow. I mean, we're a prairie province, so we have nothing but land to grow. We have all these resources and there's industries that are beginning now that weren't there before. I was actually speaking with the um the head of mortgages from RBC from Southern Alberta. So this dude, like he runs all of the mortgage department for the half the province. And he was telling me, he's like, one thing that I didn't know is that um, as the government and the world moves towards more of a green energy is that they're moving to more towards solar power. So what does Alberta have a lot of? They have a lot of sun and they have a lot of space. So, I mean, we have more sun in Southern Alberta than they do in California. I think it's like 330 days a year. So now this whole industry is being developed um, for people to have you know, reusable energy. Um, also the tech companies, the big tech companies are looking at Calgary as a place to set up shop and already are because there was a point in time where 26% of our commercial real estate downtown was vacant. And so they're buying it for pennies on the dollar. Um, they're getting in for cheap and there's people here that want to move. So our tech industry is starting to grow and, and not take over. It's still not even close to the oil industry, but it's predicted that at some point in time it could. And if we get a replacement industry in Alberta, because everyone always shits on us about like all you're good for is oil. And it's like, yeah, well, you kind of all need that. So I guess it's sort of important. But if in theory, we have a, an industry that replaces oil, that mm. makes us even more sustainable and stable as an economy. So from an investment standpoint, long term, I mean, there's there's a lot to consider. Now, will they change the rent control rules? Will they add PST? I can't predict that. But at this point in time, I think it's likely that they will, to be honest. Um, yeah. But uh, but but right now, uh, we don't have it. Once people start making too much money, that's when the regulations come in, which we've seen in Ontario yeah. and BC. And uh, yeah. okay, it might be sunny 330 days a year, but it might also be minus 30. So I just want to clarify that you can have both. 
<laughs> Let's talk about that for a second. Um, currently, right now, it's t-shirt weather. Um, we get Chinooks. What, in, is t- uh, in what does t-shirt weather mean in Calgary? Minus two? Um, I, I think it's probably like plus four today. I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, it's 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 like so like minus five here is way different than minus five where you guys are because it's super dry. But um, we get Chinooks all winter long, and yes, we do get minus thirty. We get it for like ten to fourteen days a year, and it sucks super bad. Um. But, uh, but I mean, it's fairly mild Edmonton winters. They're way worse. So don't move there. <laughs> but one thing you're going to have to, they are way worse just cause you're in Edmonton. Nothing to do with the weather. True. Um, yeah. the thing you do have to worry about though, is you you guys stand a very good chance of going through what we went through previously. And now this is the second time we've gone through it. Um, in my career, the first time was kind of the oh eight nine which was you do have all of these people that are going to come in and they're going to try and do things like flip the paper. They're going to buy an assignment and, and hope that it works out in the same way. And at some point, like it or not, the, if people buy assignments, eventually if there's enough assignments or, or pre-sales, there will be a point in time when you can't sell those because the market has dipped. Like, cause the market is yeah. cyclical. It's going to go up. It's going to go down, whatever. So if you are thinking about making a Vancouver style or Toronto style move into Calgary, like you got to be careful because you're going to hit a cycle at some point. And I I worry that the people that did buy a presale in 21 that are maybe now completing now that are making the 150 grand. But that's not why you should be buying. probably not going to happen again. You should buy their long term. Yeah, buy it and hold it for 20 years. Who cares? I agree. That's not what and people want to do, Tom. That's not what people want to do. They want the quick buck, man. It, I had somebody we, just yesterday phone me from, from Calgary looking for the, the pre-sale in Surrey. And I'm like, ah, stop, stop. And, and they can't. You make, you make a really good point. And to touch on that, um, there's only one builder in Calgary that I'm aware of that even allows assignments. Um, they are written into the contracts here that you're not allowed to assign. Um, I've had a lot of people reach out to me about assigning their properties. Um, so that's that's one thing that maybe is helping us. Um, but again, to come back to it, like there's there's a there's two listings that we have on the market right now where the, the dude bought it in uh in april took possession in september and was expecting it to shoot up 100 grand by the time he took it and i'm like dude no you're not gonna make any money on this one like you're gonna lose Mm -hmm. and he's desperate now to get his money out and he's pleading with me to sell it because he's doesn't want to rent it he he bought it for that purpose so i think the conversation needs to be an honest conversation with someone that's going to tell you the truth they're like this is either going to work for you or it's not so you can find someone and that's the, the downside to sales is like there's a lot of people that are in it for the money and aren't going to be honest with you or whatever. That's not the game we like to play. Um, but I had to just be honest. I'm like, look, this is not the, he's been on the market with a different realtor for 80 days and they're not selling. I'm like, it's cause your price $25,000 too high. Like you, you have to drop your price. It's not, you're not just going to hope for the best and win here. It's not like the, if that's what you want, then don't come here. We don't want you here for that reason. Oh, like, I feel, I feel to, the same to be rude. way. Yeah, I feel the same way where I am because I I put out a video saying where the best investment is likely going to be in Surrey over the next X amount of years, right? So this is Did you find any place? Ah, Ha 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 ha, Tom. (laughs) That was good. (laughs) But this is actually the place I'm looking at. And I'm actually looking at a particular floor plan, a style, that sort of thing. So I put out a video about it like, hey, this is where I think it's good because I legitimately think it's good. That video has booked me more calls than any other video this year, which is hmm. great. More calls from clients that are looking to buy and I can help them. That's fantastic. However, I've talked every single one of them out of it because yeah. guess what, guys? You're $700 to $1,000 negative cash flow because everybody thinks they're going to come in at 20% down and it's just not going to happen. 40% down is break even right now. Wow. So what's, what's it like for you, Derek? Um, sorry to, sorry to cut you off, that. Steve. Sorry. Yeah, you you're at, we're at the point now where if you if you're not buying something with an upper and a lower, you're breaking even. Okay. At twenty percent, Steve, go on. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off. Yeah, it's just like you do have to make sure the person you're dealing with is giving you the goods, because the the, the video and the lead generation that is my YouTube channel is designed to get those people on the phone, and then if that's done by the wrong person. Mm. They're going to sink you into, of course, yeah, because these guys all want pre-sales, right? And I'm like, listen, 
don't do it, man. Don't do it. Yeah. You're going to pay you're going to pay $800,000 for something you can buy for 640 today. Don't do it. And by the way, at 640, it's 40% down to break even. So what do you think it is yeah. at 800? And yeah. they don't get it. So you got to be careful with who you're dealing with cuz you do have to have that open and honest conversation. I mean, I've it was a great video to to generate leads and then when you find out how uneducated the people are that are coming in to try and do this stuff and make a quick buck. It's like, please save yourself, man. Stop being, stop trying to be Grant Cardone and go for broke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Derek. So by the way, everything we've talked about for Calgary, we will send us a link. We'll put it in the description. If you want to reach out to a guy that knows what he's talking about and is just a good human being, I think Derek's got to talk to if you're thinking about Calgary. Um, the way I want to wrap this up, I'm only asking you this because you gave us permission. You had talked about the fact that something happened in your life this year that's kind of made you rethink life and business and just everything. I think it'll be a nice way to, to maybe, I don't know if you'll a good way to wrap up the show or not, but I, I want to hear you talk about it. Just, there's all these things going on. All three of us, you know, you know, we are in real estate, but that's not what we are. We have families. We have other things going on in our lives. This is what we do. This podcast is a, is a, it's maybe hobby is the wrong word, but like we do it because we like having conversation with people. Yes. Does it create business for us? But I was so single-minded focused for so long on just building, building, building. Derek, do you mind wrapping up the show with just kind of how you're thinking about life these days? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so unfortunately I lost my mom in July, who was a huge part of my life. You know, anyone that knows my story knows that she lived with me for a long time and she was a realtor. My grandpa was a realtor. Um, my mom was always my sounding board, uh, after, after, um, I guess I don't want to use the words I made it, but after I had gotten to a point where, you know, we had a successful business, I put my mom on salary. <laughs> she was my consultant and her, her job was just to take my calls, um, talk me off the ledge whenever I was ready to lose my shit and, um, order my lunches. <laughs> And she got paid a salary to do that. Um, and it, it was a really cool feeling. I paid off her debt. Um, and again, in no way am I trying to brag about how awesome I think I am. It's just like that, that was the situation that her and I had. And that was always the deal. Like help, move in with me, help me get out of construction into real estate and I'll take care of you forever. So um, she passed away suddenly uh, this summer. And so that was a huge shock for us. But um, Catherine and I, we're like you guys. Um, we're very driven. We're very f laser beam focused. Um, we want to have a life of abundance for our children. And we want to have these things that you know, not everyone can have, but we also want to have time to enjoy those things. And so one thing that's happened for me in the last two years before my mom even passed was I started really seeing through the bullshit and the smoke and mirrors of like what social media shows you. Um, I used to take everything. And I think this comes back to Steve's last point about people like they see something on the internet, they think it's true because one guy did it and then they want to copy it. And it's just like, there's always so much more, but I started, I started really looking at the way I felt when I was looking at other people and seeing their massive success and all these things. And it just made me feel like shit about myself. Um, even though I have this story that people tell me is inspiring and unusual and unique and whatever, even though I have this story, I still feel like at times I'm not good enough. And I'm, you know, all these things, Alex Hermosi, actually, I listened to a podcast of his recently. He said, um, elite people, highly successful people have three things in common. One, they have a superiority complex. So they think that they can do everything. Um, and two, they think they're not good enough. Uh, so which is counterintuitive, right? So it's like, I can do everything. I can, I can accomplish these big goals, but I, I don't think I'm good enough. So they have this chip on their shoulder that they constantly have to prove something to someone. Um, and the third thing is that they have incredible impulse control, which is another topic that we've talked about on the show is that like, you know, build the foundation, start small, like have a thousand dollars in your bank. So, um, again, to recap that, like superiority complex, um, highly insecure, like feel like they're not good enough and impulse control. And that's me. That, that is totally me. Um, and so when my mom passed away, I just like, I just took a step back and I was just like, what is it that I want? Like, what, what truly is it that I want? And when I look at my life now, five years ago, I wanted exactly what I have now. I, I wanted, you know, we're not married yet. We will be at some point. Tom and you know you, you and me and Steve, we all have different opinions on marriage and all these things. But uh, it's important to me. We haven't had a chance because we've been too fucking busy. But um, <laughs> we will get married at some point. Um, 
But like, I mean, I love this woman with everything that I have and, uh, and she's the perfect partner for me. And, and five years ago, I wanted that. I wanted a partner and I wanted a family and I wanted a dream house and I wanted a million dollar business. And now I have those things. And I'm like, what now? What do I want now? What do I truly want for my life? And, and the truth is like, do I want to build the business? Yes. Do I want to increase the net worth? Yes. Do I want to continue, um, you know, setting big goals and going after things? Of course I do. But now I just want to enjoy my life. I want to have five o'clock be a shut off time for my business and Saturdays and Sundays off. So when my mom passed away, I started doing that. And, and someone challenged me once. They were like, well, what is it what you want for life? I, I was like, I want to play my guitar more and I want to go surfing and I want to go on trips. And it's like, why aren't you doing that? It's like, well, I got to build a business. And she said to me, she looked at me and she said, so let me get this straight. You're not doing the things that you want to do because you're taking your time to build a business so you can do the things that you want to do later in life. It doesn't make any sense. You have to integrate both of them. So Currently, as it speaks right now, um, we have a trip to Costa Rica coming up next year. We have a trip to, uh, we're going to Cabo for my 40th birthday. Nice. Um, one of my favorite bands ever is NoFX, and they just announced their final tour. So we're going to see their very last show ever in Los Angeles in October. So like, we're just booking shit and we're just doing things and we're, and we're taking the time to enjoy it because um, I've really seen that none of this shit matters. Like it, it doesn't matter how much money you have, how big your business is. If you come home at the end of the day and you hate your life and you don't want to get out of bed, then what's the point? So that's been my revelation. That's been stuff that I've been working on um, and allowing myself the opportunity to just be easy, like just be chill. Like the deal fell apart, wasn't meant to be or whatever, you know, like just relaxing and not being so fucking hard on myself because that's one thing I think all highly successful people struggle with. We're all insecure. And even though we don't want to admit it because our Instagram profiles will never admit that we feel like we're not good enough. Like at some level, there's a reason why we're pushing to grow and become successful. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's, it's just an innate human quality. But I think if you could recognize it and be okay with it for a minute to be like, Hey, this is all right. I'm just going to chill here. And like, if we don't grow another dollar in our business and we stay at a million bucks a year in income and living in the house that we're living in and having our properties pay for our lifestyle dude we won pretty good pretty good we won yeah, yeah. that's it yeah the, the carrot's always there you can always chase it there's always a higher floor there's always somebody doing more and you can go a little bit crazy which I, i've been through that i've been through that chase <laughs> Um, I think we all have in different ways. I see Steve's been pretty good. I think because of the structure at the beginning of his career for the, for the family moments and being home. And you probably do that better than most people that I know in this industry. Um, I don't know. I, I don't even know if I could say anything that Derek just wrapped it up perfectly. Steve, any, any final thoughts here? I do have final thoughts. Uh, okay. Derek, love you, man. Looking forward to seeing you hopefully next week at RRI. Um, no. <laughs> the real, <laughs> I won't. I won't going? be there. Unfortunately, no. I'm <sighs> sitting this one out. I'm sitting this I'm one glad out. Glad we did this. Okay, I'm glad we did this. Then. Yeah. The real question is, maybe you can help me with this. Going into December, do we keep the stashes or do we like do we take them back off? Again? This episode's December third. It's coming out. I think I'm going to keep mine. I think we're we're going here. I think we might have to. Hey man, do you that. do you. I mean, if you're looking for that creepy like vibe look, then you've guys nailed it. <laughs> Because next, <laughs> well, here's the funny thing. So we've got someone from Montreal lined up for next week. Yep. Uh huh. And I know Tom's trying to work it out, but he, he is, his whole mustache was quite French last week. Hmm. So he's trying to bring it around the sides now. But if we can trim it back up a little bit higher and get that French look going on, I think it might fit in. So we I might think, have to keep these. I think I'll keep it for, for the next week as well. I got to say, if you guys can rock mustaches like that and still be successful, then you are my heroes even more so. <laughs> well, don't worry. When I started growing this, the market slowed down completely. So I'm not being successful. Um, <laughs> what a great episode. Super inspiring. Derek, always love chatting with you. Um, like we said a few times in the episode, if you are looking at Calgary as an opportunity, I think there is. If you're if you're thinking long term, you know, they're going to make 100 grand in the next year by owning there, I think you want to talk to someone in that market there's no one i would recommend more than the guy in the middle of the screen so we'll put that link in the description thank you for listening thank you for watching uh thank you for uh, looking at our mustaches for the last hour have an amazing day and we will see you next week bye thanks derek man that was okay fantastic. hold on